You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Wednesday, the 5th of March, 2014. Boy 9 shows signs of extremism as British Muslims claim to be targeted by authorities. Immigrant who brutally raped a woman one month after arriving in the UK is given life in prison by judges who say original 10-year sentence was too lenient. Mirror's shocking investigation reveals sex trade in girls bought in Romania and sold as prostitutes in Britain. Italy lost 111,000 firms in 2013. 80,000 illegals at our border, says Spain. Egyptian court bans Hamas activities in Egypt. Israel intercepts ship carrying dozens of rockets intended for Gaza Strip. Thought for the day, indoctrination in everyday life. And finally, a shining light. All is not lost. UK News. Boy 9 showed signs of extremism as British Muslims claimed to be targeted by authorities. Anti-terror experts fear children as young as nine are exhibiting signs of Islamic extremism and police have revealed a total of 2,653 young people aged 15 to 24 were referred to government-funded de-radicalisation programmes between 2006 and 2013. According to a report by Islamic campaign group CAGE, school children are being reported to authorities by schools, youth workers and doctors amid concerns they are exhibiting signs of extremism. Research included in the 56-page document claims children with extreme political views are being sent for deprogramming. The group, which is closely linked to former Guantanamo Bay detainee Moazan Beg, 45, arrested last week on suspicion of Syria-related terror offences, reckons the government is overstepping the mark by targeting kids for its prevent strategy. The strategy is designed to tackle the problem of terrorism at its roots, preventing people from supporting terrorism or becoming terrorists themselves. Cases quoted in the findings include a nine-year-old boy in East London who was referred to the authorities after allegedly showing signs of extremism, the youngest case known in Britain. He was deprogrammed according to a source with knowledge of the case. And in Blackburn, Lancashire, at least 80 people were reported to the authorities for showing signs of extremism. They were referred to the Channel Project, part of Prevent. Cage claims the findings are part of the criminalisation of the Muslim community in the UK and have led to Britain becoming a security state for followers of Islam. World at eight. This is what the vast majority of Muslims come over and breed for. It is for Islam, not to help out us Europeans in any way, shape or form. Immigrant who brutally raped a woman one month after arriving in the UK is given life in prison by judges who say original 10-year sentence was too lenient. A convicted rapist who carried out a brutal sex attack on a woman one month after arriving in the UK from Lithuania has had his unduly lenient prison term overturned and replaced with a life sentence. Gintas Burinskas, 36, dragged a woman off a street in Northampton and violently assaulted her just four months after he completed a 10-year jail prison sentence in his home country for rape. Last April, he pleaded guilty to rape and grievous bodily harm at Northampton Crown Court and was handed another 10-year sentence. But Lord Chief Justice Lord Thomas and two other judges increased the original jail term during a hearing at the Court of Appeal. They agreed with submissions made on behalf of Attorney General Dominic Grieve that the sentence was unduly lenient. Today, Lord Thomas announced the court has squashed the original sentence, replacing it with a life sentence with a minimum term of six years. He said this was a very serious, sustained, brutal attack by a very dangerous man on a vulnerable woman at night. Giving details of the offences, Lord Thomas said Berinskas, who was released from prison in Lithuania in August 2012, walked up behind his victim and grabbed her round the throat. The judge said he put his hands round her neck and squeezed her throat. She fought him and shouted, but he increased the pressure on her throat and she lost consciousness. World at eight. Although I applaud this sentence, we must remember that he will be serving it here in the UK and that he is European. Mirror's shocking investigation reveals sex trade in girls bought in Romania and sold as prostitutes in Britain. One gang boss told the Mirror, England's opened the gates and can't do nothing. Buy these girls for £500 each. They will do 20 clients a day, no problem. 
With his arms draped around two pretty young women, an Eastern European, Mr Big, prepares to sell them all for sex slaves bound for Britain. Evil Adrian Medar is just one of the network of gang bosses aiming to supply girls and make millions over the EU scrapping of our border restrictions with Romania and Bulgaria. They aim to flood the UK with thousands of young women sold into a sordid nightmare life of vice. National Crime Agency figures show that there were 1,746 reports of human trafficking from 112 countries last year, a 47% leap on a 2012 total. And in 2010, the Association of Chief of Police Officers estimated that up to 12,200 women working in off-street prostitution in Britain had possibly been trafficked. It is little wonder a confident Maidar told our investigators. There will be no problem if somebody asks at immigration, what do you do here? Then the girls say, I work in a hotel or I have a friend. They have 1,000 possible lies. Don't worry about it. The Romanian girls are not stupid. They go with identity card now. Hmm. Well, to date, note the term Eastern European, or rather Euro trash. Not nice people at all. Why did the EU relax our borders? To get rid of this trash and their money-making pimping. But this has been going on for years in London and the big cities because they've been coming in illegally anyway. Watch the spread of AIDS and TB hit new heights. European news. Italy lost 111,000 firms in 2013. Some 111,000 Italian companies went bust in 2013, one of the worst years since the 2008 global financial crisis, according to figures from the surveyed research agency obtained by ANSA Tuesday. Bankruptcies and liquidations were 7.3% up on 2012, beating all records, the survey said, with industry particularly hard hit, especially in the once booming northeast. Italy's longest post-war recession officially ended with flat growth in the third quarter of last year and a 0.1 rise in the last quarter, but unemployment is still running at a record high and businesses are struggling to recover. 80,000 illegals at our border, says Spain. Some 80,000 Moroccan and Mauritanian illegal immigrants are seeking to enter Europe through the Spanish enclaves of Ceuta and Melilla, Spanish Interior Minister Jorge Fernandez Diaz said on Tuesday in a speech to 127 new Catalan police officers. The numbers came from Spanish, Moroccan and Mauritanian intelligence, the minister said. Diaz yesterday called on the European Union to give Spain 45 million euros to handle the grave crisis it is facing in its two cities, which are located within Moroccan territory. The immigrants hail from Morocco and Mauritania in equal measure, and many are being trafficked by criminal organisations, the minister said, qualifying the situation in the two Spanish enclaves as an absolute emergency. World date. The only people that get anything out of immigrants are the criminal organisations, not the migrants, not the host countries, and certainly not the host people. Europe and the UK are going to have to come to terms with not being Mr Nice Guys over this at all, or else we're all lost. World News Egyptian court bans Hamas activities in Egypt. An Egyptian court today order, ordering the banning of Hamas work and activities in Egypt and the seizure of its assets. The Palestinian organisation controls Gaza Strip. The court also shut down Hamas offices in Egypt but did not label it as a terrorist group since it had no jurisdiction in the matter. Hamas condemned the ruling. The decision harms the image of Egypt and its role towards the Palestinian cause, says Sami Abu Ziri, a spokesman for the Gaza-based group. The reasons for the court's decision have not been disclosed, but the latter stems from the new attitude towards the group, which is tied to the Muslim Brotherhood, by the authorities in Cairo after the ousting of President Mohamed Morsi. Since then, the Egyptian government has, amongst other things, destroyed most of the 1,200 tunnels used to smuggle food, cars and weapons into the coastal enclave, which is under an Israeli blockade. Egypt's current rulers have accused Hamas of plotting with Morsi to organise terrorist attacks in the country. Several Hamas members are among the defendants in the trial against the former president. Similarly, the Palestinian group has been accused of supporting Islamist groups close to al-Qaeda in the Sinai, charges it has rejected. Well, world date. Well, it would, wouldn't it? Israel intercepts ships carrying dozens of rockets intended for Gaza Strip. Israel says it has intercepted a ship carrying dozens of advanced Iranian-supplied rockets intended for guerrillas in the Gaza Strip. 
Moshe Yalon, Israel's defence minister, claimed the rockets had been supplied by Iran and made in Syria. Hamas said the announcement was a silly joke aimed at helping Israel to prolong the blockage of Gaza. Israel's disclosure came as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was in the United States urging tougher action on Iran. Yalon said it appears once again that Iran continues to be the biggest exporter of terrorism in the world. Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lemmer, a spokesman for the Israeli military, said the cargo, which was intercepted in the Red Sea, were weapons that could have struck deep into Israel from Gaza. He added, the M302 is its most advanced model, can strike over 100 miles, and if they would have reached Gaza, ultimately, that would have meant millions of Israelis under threat. There was no immediate comment from Iran or Syria. Israel and Islamist Hamas last fought a major conflict in November 2012. Hamas has largely held fire since, but Israel says it has been trying to build up its capabilities. That has been made difficult, however, by a new military regime in Cairo, which has cracked down on the Egyptian border with Gaza. Netanyahu's office said that the Prime Minister, who was in Los Angeles on Wednesday after holding a White House meeting and addressing a pro-Israel lobby in Washington, had approved the ship's seizure after consultations with his security chiefs. At the same time that he is talking to world powers, at the same time that Iran is smiling and saying all kinds of honeyed words, that same Iran is sending lethal weaponry to terrorist organisations and is doing so in a complex web of covert worldwide operations, Netanyahu said from Los Angeles. Thought for the day. Indoctrination in everyday life. If you think about it, we are all indoctrinated from day one, and since the last world war, this indoctrination has taken a sinister turn. In truth, any form of indoctrination, including propaganda, has been in use since the early 20th century, and in its initial form was of course used by the Bolsheviks in Russia to great effect. And along with the disastrous war sped along the event of communism in that country, the peasants, of course, always being revolting. Wikipedia states that propaganda is a form of communication aimed towards influencing the attitude of the community towards some cause or position by presenting only one side of the argument. Propaganda statements may be partly false and partly true. Propaganda is usually repeated and dispersed over a wide variety of media in order to create the chosen result in audience attitudes. As opposed to impartially providing information, propaganda, in its most basic sense, presents information primarily to influence an audience. Propaganda often presents facts selectively, thus possibly lying by omission, to encourage a particular synthesis or uses loaded messages to produce an emotional rather than a rational response to the information presented. The desired result is a change of the attitude towards the subject in the target audience to further a political, religious or commercial agenda. Propaganda can be used as a form of ideological or commercial warfare. The term comes from modern Latin. Originally, this word derived from a new administrative body of the Catholic Church, Congregation, created in 1622, called the Congregatio de Propaganda Feed, Congregation for Propagating the Faith or informally simply propaganda. Its activity was aimed at propagating the Catholic faith in non-Catholic countries. From the 1790s the term began being used for propaganda in secular activities. The term began taking a pejorative connotation in the mid-19th century when it was used in the political sphere. Nowadays we have a wonderful propaganda machine and it is called the television. If Stalin, Mao, Hitler and Pol Pot had had this amount of airtime that has confused and influenced so many in our time, then world history would have turned out very differently. Not necessarily better, but different. People who declare they are too educated or cultivated for TV are missing out on the greatest plot of all time, that of the subjugation of the masses. True, we have become like the States with too many options and not enough quality, but the message is still coming in long and hard. Diversity, multiculturalism and the far left-wing Marxist liberal view of what this country should be and indeed the world today. It started out as misinformation and misdirection, but has now evolved to sheer propaganda at an almost laughable level. Take the political wing of this information bias and listen to the home front first. We have foreigners in positions of political power which they couldn't or didn't attain in their own countries and their agenda is not for the English. 
We have a conservative Lib coalition, which is a push-me, pull-you affair, and a Labour-red Jewish Marxist who would be more at home on Red Square. Plus, we have a Chancellor who wants to give money we don't have to anyone as long as they are not situated in England. The TV media news is a real doozy of misinformation and propaganda, and of course it always hypes up and supports any form of terrorism or protesters in other countries to be for the good of the people. Now, I'm not a person who thinks that everything for the good of the people is necessarily that. It is often, and perhaps always, is not for the good of anyone other than the people who back these protesters, and most of them are nefarious and have converging agendas. Listen to the reports on Kiev very carefully, and they sound like the news that spewed its propaganda on Palestine, the Balkans, Libya, Egypt, Iraq and Syria. In short, almost everything happening on the international scene is biased reporting carried to our sets by almost frantic newscasters getting het up over and hyped up over a situation which, if ignored, would just go away or settle itself naturally. Of course, whether that settlement would please the UN, the EU or NATO is dubious. But it's well known most of these organisations need training for their troops, so in we go, boys. But of course, on another ridiculous thing, UN troops cannot fire unless they are fired upon. So there you are, a UN soldier, lying there with your legs six feet away from your body, trying to fire a gun at someone who is hidden, and it's all too late, matey. It's rather like sending a man into a pissoir and telling him he mustn't pee. Then, of course, the UN and NATO all sit around talking about the atrocities and crimes against humanity that they themselves have orchestrated as propaganda. And these propaganda machines last for years and years, with investigations, hunts and court cases, which all take up their useless lives. And we mustn't forget the Nazi propaganda machine, which the world will never equal. The Third Reich did it without TV, and did it very well. It, of course, appealed to a people decimated by the Treaty of Versailles and virtually starving. And also, it must be said that a people who did not have TV ramming an alternative message into their heads every day and every night. That message is, it is not good to be white or English. If you are, you must assimilate immediately by selecting an ethnic partner and or producing an ethnic child. Ethnics, and especially Muslims, are good, peaceful and care for you. The church and Christianity are bad, and even atheism is preferred. Sharia law is coming, and you must submit. Any form of nationalist feelings, or trying to protect your country or the countryside, is an abomination against Britain and the British. White children will not be educated any more in the state system. It's being given to the foreigners who come to this country. White females will have compulsory abortions if their partners are white. Young white females must make themselves available for abduction and rape by Muslims and other foreign sex traffickers. All blue-collar workers and labourers will be non-English. This covers everything from coffee houses to our farms. Halal is mandatory and never to be questioned. A high percentage of all people in equity will be encouraged to be of an ethnic majority. An even higher percentage of films and TV plays, even our classics, will feature heavily on the foreigner and to the detriment of our colonial past, for which you will all be made to suffer. All charities and sponsorship programmes will be ethnically biased, if not outright black or Asian. All newcasters and reporters on TV will be ethnic. All ethnic history and religions will be taught in our schools. All our universities will have ethnic clubs, unions, plus a well-funded Islamic studies group and communist programme. And no right-wing bias will be tolerated whatsoever. You will not go out at night and not socialise with your own kind. This brings trouble and a police visit. Remember, you must never comment on any housing situation, public nuisance or attack if it is if an ethnic is involved, because he has more rights than you. Big Brother is here now, and he is an ethnic with the white establishment firmly behind him. If this sounds like a mantra from the Third Reich, you would be right. That is what propaganda is, and this new form of propaganda is what you see and hear every day of every month of every year 
since 1945. It has bred at least three generations of a docile, anti-social, anti-thinking breed of English sheeples. It has bred a new nation of Asian shopkeepers only too happy to supply the booze, drugs and smokes to enable you all to stay home and watch even more propaganda on TV every night. As do the foreign takeaways. No need to shop and cook. Just pick up the phone and pay money and stay in your home. There must be a curfew around somewhere, but I haven't noticed it in certain towns, when all the foreigners come out at night and tell the Brits to bugger off. And the clever thing is that you all believe it's for your own good. Now the chattering classes are dead. They are defunct. They are non-chattering classes, in the words of John Cleese and the dead parrot. They have all been lobotomized. Most, if not all, a very high percentage of us actually believe that we get what we vote for when we, in fact we don't. Why? Because a high majority of the Brits don't vote. They've been indoctrinated to believe that it doesn't matter whether they make the effort or not. Things will always be the same. While at the same time all the parties are busy bussing in ethnics to vote for them and outvote you. A swift look at any national rag will tell you where we are told to put our faith. Firmly in the hands of multiculturalism and diversity. We raise the roof when a noisy kid is sellotape quiet and I'm afraid that this teacher comes from Spain where the children are much more disciplined by their families than ours. Good on her. If a child is noisy in class they should be sent out or punished. One of the stupid mantras today is everything children do is okay and this lack of culpability extends well into the late teens. And yet we still have awful cases of child cruelty. I can understand getting somewhat het up over the ruddy Nepalese kids in our close. They're the only ones who play in the centre of bitter green and yell and scream all the time. What is it with children who scream all the time? I had children and grandchildren and believe it or not, once I was a child as well. But if we yelled we were told to be quiet and play quietly. Now with all the propaganda on how not to discipline your own child, we have entire roads of kids yelling and screaming for absolutely no reason at all. Thank you, liberal child. Whatevers. And of course, if ethnic, one mustn't even notice it. Immigrants, foreigners, cuckoos, in fact all of them, have been listening to the same sort of propaganda that we have had to endure. Only it has gone in their favour, not ours. Now they know they can literally get away with murder because of their colour, and their race card is the most popular game in the UK, especially with the plods and the legal system. And it is all due to TV and media propaganda, because everyone watches television at some time, and the message is always there, even subliminally. And if in doubt, you can always get it on your mobile. And we all know that every immigrant is given money for a mobile phone on entering the country, as well as money for TVs and cars. So even though they may speak no English, they don't need to, because they gravitate towards their own section of ethnics and set up their own clans. As soon as some poor unfortunate mentions immigration, they have a plethora of shows on Question Time or some such diversity propaganda machine, which ends in spelling out the message that immigration is good for us because we're all an ageing population, and any nationalistic fervour is stamped on once and for all. Listen to the news, and it is now all anti-Putin, pro-immigration, and even UKIP has been mooted as a racist political party, which is in fact an outright lie. Farage likes immigration, cozies up to Islam, and would never leave the EU, even though he does bugger all when he's over there. So does the propaganda machine in this country think he will get more votes from the White Van Brigade? Doubtful. They're all inside watching football. If I hear anything more on the sodding telephone bugging and that awful redhead, I'll puke. And as for Kiev, the first country that Hitler liberated was the Sudetenland, which were the German-speaking peoples of France. So Putin is entitled to look after his own Russian-speaking people in the Ukraine. Put up a wall, Putin. I love walls. Also, if I see that bloody Oscar-winning film 12 Years a Slave, I'll definitely throw up. My great-grandfather had slaves and he treated them very well. In fact, if slavery was so awful for a few, why didn't they go back to Africa and their own tribes when they had the chance? Propaganda. That's why. Propaganda has reached our police force with great effect. Try not to live near or next to an ethnic. 
because if they don't like you, they will report you for racial harassment. And nothing pleases the plods and the CPS, like cases that centre round racism, even though they only have the word of the supposed plaintiff and the white perpetrator has done nothing of the kind. This is the direct result of anti-white racist propaganda. Propaganda has a lot to answer for, especially when the message is a warped one, and one that has had such an insidious effect on the population of the United Kingdom. Next, it will be pills and euthanasia for the over 50s, or a form of Roman games. We've already, we already have Sodom and Gomorrah for the Brits, don't we? And finally, a shining light. It is 11 years since 9-11, and here is a wonderful story about that terrible day. Jerry Brown, Delta Flight 15. Here's an amazing story from a flight attendant on Delta Flight 15, written following 9-11. On the morning of Tuesday, September the 11th, we were about five hours out of Frankfurt, flying over the North Atlantic. All of a sudden, the curtains parted and I was told to go to the cockpit, immediately to see the captain. As soon as I got there, I noticed the crew had that all-business look on their faces. The captain handed me a printed message. It was from Delta's main office at Atlanta and simply read, all airways over the continental United States are closed to commercial air traffic. Land ASAP at the nearest airport. Advise your destination. The captain determined that the nearest airport was 400 miles behind us in Gander, Newfoundland. He requested approval for route change from the Canadian traffic controller, and approval was granted immediately. We decided to lie to the passengers while we were still in the air. We told them the plane had a simple instrument problem and that we needed to land at the nearest airport in Gander, Newfoundland, to have it checked out. After we parked on the ramp, the captain made the following announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, you must be wondering if all these airplanes around us have the same instrument problem as we have. The reality is that we're here for another reason. He then went on to explain the little bit we knew about the situation in the US. There were loud gasps and stares of disbelief. The Canadian government was in charge of our situation and no one was allowed to get off the aircraft. Meanwhile, bits of news started to come in over the aircraft radio and for the first time we learned that aeroplanes had flown into the World Trade Centre in New York and into the Pentagon in DC. After that, we, the crew, were separated from the passengers and we were taken in vans to a small hotel. We had no idea where our passengers were going. We learned from the aircraft that the the Red Cross, that the town of Gander has a population of 10,400 people and that they had about 10,500 passengers to take care of from all the aeroplanes that were forced into Gander. Meanwhile, we had lots of time on our hands and found the people of Gander were extremely friendly. Two days later, we got that call and were taken back to Gander Airport. Back on the plane, we were reunited with the passengers and found out what they'd been doing the past two days. What we found out was incredible. Gander and all the surrounding communities within about a 75 kilometre radius had closed all high schools, meeting halls, lodges and any other large gathering places. They converted all these facilities to mass lodging areas for all the stranded travellers. Some had cots set up, some had mats with sleeping bags and pillows. All the high school students were required to volunteer their time to take care of the guests. Our 218 passengers ended up in a town called Lewisport, about 45 kilometres from Gander, where they were put up in a high school. The local Red Cross and all, had all the information about the whereabouts of each and every passenger and knew which plane they needed to be on when all the planes were leaving. They coordinated everything beautifully. Food was prepared by all the residents and brought to the schools. People were driven to restaurants and their choice and offered wonderful meals. And then a very unusual thing happened. One of our passengers approached me and asked if he could make an announcement over the PA system. We never ever allow that, but this time was different and I said of course and handed him the mic. He picked up the PA and reminded everyone about about what they had just gone through in the last few days. He reminded them of the hospitality they'd received at the hands of total strangers. He said he was going to set up a trust fund under the name of Delta 15. The purpose of the trust fund is to provide college scholarships for the high school students of Lewisport. He asked for donations of any amount from his fellow travellers. When the paper with donations got back to us with the amounts, names and phone numbers and addresses, the total was for more than $14,000. The gentleman, an MD from Virginia, promised to match the donations and to start administrative work on the scholarship. He also said he would forward this proposal to Delta Corporate and ask them to donate as well. As I write this account, the trust fund is more than $1.5 million and has assisted 134 in college education. 
I just wanted to share this story because we need good stories right now. It gives me a little bit of hope to know that some people in a faraway place were kind to some strangers who literally dropped in on them. It reminds me of how much good there's still in the world. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart and I wish you all a very good night.